Thank you all for coming. My name is Morgan Jafford. I'm here to talk today about, uh, about the rise and fall of defined development and, uh, and some of the things that kind of go along the way. Um, this is a talk about running indie studios and studio management, but it's not really about that. Uh, I'm gonna lie to you a lot about what this talk is about. Um, one thing that is true when we talk about business conversations, and, and this is a studio management kind of perspective on things, uh, is we often don't talk about the, the human factors and the human cost and the feelings and emotions that go alongside running studios. And there's really good reasons for that, particularly if you have staff. Um, nobody wants to hear that their boss is sad um, and worry whether or not they'll have a job the next week. So given that defined development is now uh, a little over three years deceased, um, that gives me the opportunity to speak really frankly and honestly about, uh, about some of the ins and outs in a way that I wouldn't have spoken publicly uh, while it was running. And this talk is about studio management. It's also about failure and it's about closure. It's about how to hopefully avoid ending up in the situation we did. Um, but it's also about some of the reasons that we ended up making those decisions. And you know, I'm not fundamentally a believer that companies need to be eternal entities that run until the end of time. Uh, it, it, is, it is a model to understand what you're for and what you're about and, uh, and to run for that period of time. So, but this is also a talk about, uh, about sadness. It's a talk about identity um, and what it means to, to be a visible game developer, uh, especially in the indie space. Um, to talk about, you know, loss and what you do after things go wrong. And, but one of the things I want to talk about to, to kind of kick things off, some of you know about Defiant Development, some of you may not. Um, it was a studio that was founded uh, post-GFC in Australia. And during the GFC, Australia lost a lot of games jobs. We lost about 75% of the games jobs in Australia. Uh, lots of people lost their jobs. Some, of them, some people lost their jobs multiple times, um, going from one studio closure to the next studio closure to the next. And it left the Australian landscape, uh, which had been previously dominated by American-owned international studios, uh, in a really grim position. Uh, Dan, the co-founder of Define Development, and I uh, started the company in that environment. We started it with a really clear mission. You know, we wanted to build a company that gave people great jobs, working on exciting games, so that those great people that we knew were out there had, had opportunities. And we started small, but, uh, but across 10 years, we built uh, a studio that honored those goals at every stage of, along the way, um, I, I believe, in any case, and uh, I, I am biased. Um, and when you're setting up the goals for a studio, I think it's really, important, particularly in that sort of environment. It's very easy to talk about the things you're not going to do. Like, we're gonna avoid all of these mistakes that the big studios made. Negative goals, I don't think, help you get to a destination. Positive goals can help you get to where you're going. So, we had a studio and we knew what it was for. And one thing I wanna stress here, there are two elements that I really wanna kind of knuckle down on. One, many of the things I talk about will sound simple. None of them are simple. They, they were all very complex situations. But this is a one hour talk and I'm gonna go through things fast. So if, if you happen to listen and go, gosh, that sounds simple, he's an idiot. You could be right. <laughs> but you might not be. And the other is that this is, this is my story. Um, across the, the lifespan of Defiant, and there are some people in this room, um, over 50 people were involved, either as staff or, or working on the periphery. Um, at our peak, we had, we had 30 full-timers. They all have their own stories, and they are absolutely as important as mine. 
I got to see quite a lot from my seat, but I sure didn't see everything. So if you're interested, please ask, and, and they'll tell you. And the last thing I want to stress just before we move on is that, you know, I talk to a lot of people who run studios, um, both smaller and larger than Defiant, and I talk to a lot of people who find that experience incredibly stressful and who are, who are very um, unhappy in, in the role that they're in. And there were stressful moments at the end, don't get me wrong. But if there's one thing I want you to take away from this is that 10 years of that journey for me was just a great time. I was walking into a room full of creative people doing, doing work that, that I loved and that they loved and, uh, and it made me happy. So uh, I think it's important to, to hold that context as we go. So before we closed down Define, we were working on a new project. We'd, we'd delivered Hand of Fate 1, which was a success and it enabled us to grow. We delivered Hand of Fate 2, which was a success and had quite a lot of post-launch support. And we were looking at new projects. And there is a lens that we apply, that we applied, sorry, I, my tenses will wobble. Um, there's a lens that we applied at Defiant to, to find a meaningful project. It had to sit somewhere in the Venn diagram of games we wanted to make, games we felt there was an audience for, and games that our team could make as well as anybody else. And also, we always wanted to make sure every new project was something new and something old. That it combined something we knew how to do and could rely on, uh, along with some things we'd never done before and you know, we knew we'd learn along the way. That's, that's how Hand of Fate came to be. So the, the game we were working on was called A World in My Attic. You can go and look at the trailer. It still exists, although the project is no more. Um, and it was taking Hand of Fate, which is a card game that comes to life, and it was taking it to, to kind of a new level in that it was an open world zelda -y game with a Settlers of Catan set of hexes. You'd build your world and then you'd go out and adventure in it. And that project was intentionally bigger than we'd built before. We wanted to grow the team. We wanted to make a bigger game. We, that, that was the ambition we'd set for the studio, to bring in more great people, make great games, and give them a great environment to do it in. Um, the thing I will say is a lot of our team uh, were pretty outside their comfort zone at this point in time. We'd been doing Hand of Fate at that point for five years. We really knew how to make that game. A lot of the team had joined along the road. They'd never been involved with like the messy, confusing start of a project, um, which is a whole different ball game. And it, it is difficult to express to people who've had a very solid and robust framework to work from for, from the last three or four years that it's okay. It's okay that it's messy. In the start, it is all a mess, but we're gonna put all the parts together and it's gonna to come together. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done on that front. And as the studio head, and also creative director, and a bit producer, um, the question of how I was doing is not great. My personal life was a disaster, is the truth, at this point in time. Um, my wife has a very high power job, I had a very high power job. We had two children who were six and nine, and it was a disaster because they needed us more than we could provide, and we both needed each other more than we could provide. I, I was not doing great. Um, the combination of all the, the personal and professional stress at that point in time meant that where I needed to be patient, I just didn't have the time. There is a lot of deep thinking that's involved with initiating projects. And I, I was not able to provide the support and structure that was going on. I, this is not the only issue we had. The team was very independent and capable of plugging along uh, very well. I, I, I'm not trying to take all of this on my own shoulders. But I do think it's important because we reached a position where we had a game, was bigger than any game we'd made before, was bigger than we could fund to conclusion on our own, and we needed external support. Now, we knew that, and we had great relationships with a range of publishers. We'd had good conversations all the way along, 
and, uh, and we had interest from a good half dozen publishers. Uh, the thing about interest from publishers is that it, uh, it's all very well and good until it comes time to sign a check. And everybody will say, show us a little bit more, and show us a little bit more. Um, we'd been on the show us a little bit more road for a while. And truth be told, we'd been on that road for too long. So there came a point where we sat down and went, what are our options and opportunities? And there were some options that we'd intentionally written off because they didn't fit with the, the reasons that we built the company. We weren't particularly interested in taking external investment. We weren't particularly interested in you know, uh, selling the company off wholesale. Um, and that was all fine until we realized that all of the publishing deals had now officially fallen through. And we didn't have the runway to make it to the end. So that leads to a plan uh, with no alternative positions. And our burn rate was pretty inflated. Um, and the studio was at the point where we had to do something about that, which leads into a bunch of options and opportunities. And when I was speaking earlier about like not having negative goals, like not having the, I will run a studio and I will not do this thing. I'll tell you the one that I've always held because Pandemic Australia is the studio I worked at before Defined Development. That studio was bought by EA and then it was shut down through the most brutal series of iterative cuts over the course of a year that I've ever experienced in my life. I was the last person there. I turned the lights off. I laid off 100 odd staff on behalf of EA, one piece at a time in a desperate attempt to save anybody on that lifeboat. And I will tell you one thing that is on my negative list. I was not gonna do that again. So then there were sell-offs and they didn't look very attractive either. Every option and opportunity in front of us effectively compromised the reasons that we set the studio up in the first place. So there was, there was a point where Dan sat down and ran the numbers and we looked at what we could do and how long we could go. Um, and we realized that there was no, no plan that we had that could be executed in that time frame to a positive outcome. What we could do is give people uh, good packages, clarity, and an end to their time. Um, so we ran those numbers, we ran those scenarios, and we basically came down to the point where there was, there was a decision that had to be made between a very high risk, you know, fly close to the sun, lay off three quarters of the team, try and pull something together, uh, or to call it a day. And after sleeping on it, we, we made the decision to call it a day. Um, we met with the leadership team and we explained it. And, uh, and then we met with the rest of the team and we explained it. We gave everybody, as I say, generous packages, gave them their hardware so they could work on projects if they wanted to. Uh, and it was done. It was one week from the initial decision to the studio being closed. One week from that room that I love to walk into, being full of life and vigor, to empty. And just me. And Dan. And for a moment, there was silence. So one of the things I think is the question of like, how do you avoid ending up in this situation? Which is hopefully meaningful and useful to, uh, to some of you. And the truth of the matter is that all the decisions that led to us closing down happened two years before we closed down. The, the correct time to make change was well before we reached the point where, it was, where closure was inevitable. Uh, there's, so, so this then is gonna be a talk uh, about how to avoid some of the pitfalls that we hit. But it's also not really about that either. When we started Defiant, a friend of ours who ran big studios for, for, uh, for EA and Sega uh, gave us some advice. And he said that your job is not to work in the business that you found, 
but to work on the business that you found. You, don't, you shouldn't be giving yourself a job. You should be working on building a, a business that supports people. And that seemed great, except for the fact that it seemed really stupid from the indie dev perspective. Like, why do we build studios? We build studios because we want to make games. It's the only way to get games made. That's why, that's why I started a studio. Like, all I ever wanted was to build the business I could work in. Why else do it? And I've had this conversation uh, <laughs> with a lot of indie studio heads, right? Where they're like, well, where often the question comes up, why are you creative directing that project rather than getting somebody else in to do it? And it's like, because that's the fun bit. That's why I built the whole thing, right? Like, um, and that is true, but it is limiting. And one thing that I think is important is strategy meetings. And we had strategy meetings. We had a five-year plan, we had a one-year plan, we had a two-year plan. But we'd done them all. And we hadn't updated them. And those values I showed you right at the start about what Defiant was about, that defined us. Those, those were post-GFC values. When we closed, jobs for skilled developers were easy to find. There was no, there was no shortage. And that's one of the essential reasons that we started the studio. And it just wasn't valid anymore. And by putting a big strike through one of the core pillars that had made, built the studio, we didn't have that reason to continue and press on. It is critical that you know what your company is for, but it's equally critical that you revise it and understand you know, what your company will be for. You need to work backwards from your big goals to what you're actually going to set out and achieve, right? It's, it's all about, um, you know, everybody knows about SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, whatever. Um, but specific and measurable is important. The reason our strategy meetings were nonsense is because they weren't specific and measurable. They were big and they were fluffy, and we could always feel like we were doing the big and fluffy thing. No, if you want to be bigger in five years, you say you want to be bigger in five years. We want this many people. If you don't want to be bigger in five years, and I would recommend that, uh, <laughs> um, then, then say that. Talk about how specifically you're going to do these things because you can only identify the vulnerabilities of your studio when you miss your goals. That, that's the start of the process of understanding. And you always, I mean, the thing is, we're all smart people, right? And smart people are really, really good at justifying why the step that they've taken is the right step just in front of them. Because, of course it is. It's the only natural step by the time you get there. Planning is all about structure, and it's all about setting up those goalposts. So you can come back and you can go, actually, you know what? We missed. Actually, you know what? We're not doing the thing we set out to do. Actually, you know what? Maybe this isn't the right game for us at this point in time. Actually, you know what? We need a sign off from a publisher here, or we're going to go off in a different direction. And that, for us, uh, you know, vulnerability, um, particularly uh, structural vul vulnerability for a studio, shouldn't come as a shock. Um, and I'm not saying that, uh, that we completely botched the planning, but we hadn't set our goals clearly enough to know that we were missing them along the way. We hadn't set the road clearly enough to understand that the path had gone awry. I mean, one thing I want to touch on too is, uh, is money is, like, money is a big part of running a business. You've got to keep the engine turning. Uh, you can't simply follow money, but you also can't operate without it. So you do need to make sure that you have your cash flow sorted out and you know how you're getting from one place to the next. So this, when, when I think about, you know, what would we have done differently? How would we have updated the company goals from simply being a great place for people to work, making great games? There are things that we understood and one of the big ones for me is that if you put a team of people together and you have them chew on the same sorts of problems for long enough, you get to great 
and meaningful and revolutionary games. Every great game, well, not universally true, but certainly there are a lot of great games that are examples of people who've been sitting in the background chewing away on the same sorts of problems for game after game after game after game before hitting a moment where it's great. Um, there's the, uh, there was a terrible hog game back in the day that was followed by the fun hog game that was followed by prototype. And as, as you look at prototype, you can see all those steps along the way. It's true of the Infinity Ward team who moved from Medal of Honor to Call of Duty to Call of Duty to Call of Duty to Call of Duty to Call of Duty. To call of Duty. Anyway, um, keeping developers together, running, um, chewing on the same sorts of problems is one of the fundamental beliefs I had. It's why at Defiant we had a philosophy about the games we built where we always took something old and combined it with something new. And if, if we had taken that value into one of the founding principles of the studio, we would have found a new reason to exist that could have carried us forward. Um, the other thing, you know, you've got to have big dreams, and the truth of the matter is, we, we started the studio with big dreams. We wanted, a, we wanted a game that was, you know, out on consoles. We wanted to, uh, wanted to self-publish and, and, you know, get out to the, the masses, um, and we achieved all that. And if there's one thing that you take away from, from this talk, all the planning, all the strategy, all, all the rest is, is largely irrelevant. Take this away. When you succeed, celebrate. It's really important to mark the wins along the way. Because you don't necessarily get to keep winning all the way. So, so when, you, when you pull it off, make sure you stop give each other a high five, and then you need a new plan. Then you need some new goals, you need some new ambitions. The truth is, we didn't have a big enough dream. And this is, the, a theme for this talk is advice I give others, but I'm too stupid to take myself. And, uh, and I've, I've spoken to indie devs often to say, it is important that you forge a big enough dream to act as a lighthouse for your team and your studio. Um, and the other thing is that the transitional phases of game development studios are now well known and understood. A two-person studio does not run like a 10-person studio. A 10-person studio, and a successful 10-person studio that's doing really well and making great stuff, does not run like a 20-person studio. To go from 20 to 40 or 50 is a whole nother ball game and involves a whole new layer of management and every step along this phase transition is a chance for things to go terribly wrong. And they always do, by the way. We, we had planned for them. Every, every time we changed size, we had a plan that said, you know, we're writing off six months working out how to make this happen. There is always a, uh, a discomfort as you go through those transitional periods. But you do have to plan for them if, if growing bigger is part of your, your set of goals. And each one of them is about letting go. So when you grow, uh, you find that the many different hats you've worn need to be taken off and put on individual people. So the process of growth and the process of transition is always a, uh, a place to... Um, to you know, what I've said here is, you know, put the team in charge of the dream. Uh, the, the fundamental thing that went awry here was, for me, looking at Defiant as a place I could work, um, as opposed to a place where my job was to, to help others thrive and succeed. Uh, we needed a vision that carried forward that it was a place that we were building continu continuity, we were building studio, we were building that ongoing value and forward motion. So, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that, again, in talking with other studio heads, this is really common. Everybody's like, well, I wear a lot of hats. And um, I think it's important that we understand I wear a lot of hats to be a direct synonym for I'm doing a lot of things badly. And if you would like them to be done well, it's important that you entrust people with the responsibility that goes along with those hats. Likewise, 
one of the, one of the things that I think is, is very true um, universally with games is that games only happen through belief and willpower. Everything in games is taking something that doesn't exist and just forcing it to, to be birthed into the world in reality through sheer force of will. Belief is important. And I, I'm a big believer in the people I work with, a big believer in the, the people I work with now. Uh, I, I, have, I have an enormous amount of belief. Belief needs to turn into trust and faith. And people will surprise you. So, what happened next? Uh, what I've said here is energy gets released, and this is true. And this is one of the reasons that, you know, while the closure of Defiant makes me sad, it doesn't, you know, well, I'll talk about the sadness in a minute. Um, but companies tie up people and effort and energy, and sometimes they tie up people and effort and energy as they did at Pandemic for us for several years with no outcome whatsoever. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not great. People have a right to see the, the creative output of their work. When a studio closes, all of that energy is released. And as I said, when we started Defiant, there were not great jobs around. When Defiant closed, there were great jobs around. And working for Defiant meant something for the people who'd worked for us. Um, they, they had options and opportunities to go work on great projects at great studios. I could not be more happy about the, uh, the successes of the, the Defiant alumni. Um, there are so many people along the way who've gone on to do such great things. And, uh, and that, that gives me, the fact that we were able to be a small part of that journey with them makes me happy. We did still have an office and a lease uh, at this point in time, um, which again was mainly a place that I could go and sit and be alone and feel sad. Um, but it wasn't long after uh, that, you know, Dan and I, Dan's my business partner, by the way, um, and Dan and I were, were effectively the last people standing there. So we had still had ongoing support for the old products. We weren't doing development anymore, but our games that we'd self-published were in the market. There was, there was still things to do. There was still support. And that kept us busy. Um, and it wasn't long after that that... Uh, James Scott, who was one of the programmers at Defiant, said, look, I don't want a job. But I did pitch, you know, I pitched a superhero game back in the day uh, as a thing that Defiant could work on and it wasn't the right thing for the studio at the time. He's like, Dude, can I have that? Like, of, course you can have, <laughs> of course you can have that. We're, we're not in the business of keeping people's ideas. So James started work on, uh, on what became Capes, which, uh, which is now signed to Daedalic and will be out uh, later this year. Um, and then Dan started working on that, and Sean, who'd been our art director, started working on that. And the nice thing about having an office is that there was a space in which that could happen. And, and then, you know, COVID began, and it was a big enough office that five people could, in fact, sit in opposite corners and still be socially distanced. So that, that, was, that was a positive. Um, and I got roped into that project as well. I started doing some writing and doing some design. And for Dan, I think the process of keeping busy was quite healing. And for me, it was not. It was really bad. I, I did not need to be busy. I, I, was, I was very done. So, you know, this is, this is a talk in some ways about the very many ways that games can break your heart, but it's not really about that. There's a thing that comes along with being a developer in public uh, and missing that is very shameful. Failure makes it really hard to want to put yourself out there. And the other thing for me too, is one of the things that really gave me joy uh, was acting as a mentor 
to other studios and to, uh, to other developers, offering advice where that device, advice was useful and practical. And uh, nobody wants advice from a great big failure. It's certainly how I felt at the time. Um, and the phone stopped ringing. And I think, you know, in retrospect, having spoken to people, I think people were being compassionate. So I think people didn't call because they felt like, you know, I'd taken myself away from the public eye and that was, that was a fair and reasonable thing to do. But it had stolen from me one of the pieces of joy in my life, uh, which was talking to other developers about the questions of game development. So here I am, studio's closed, some people are working on a game. I'm sort of working on a game, but not really. And it's impossible to not kind of come to terms with the fact that you may have just done the best thing professionally that you'll do, and from here it is all downhill. And I've got to say that uh, running indie studios is a thing that gave me great joy, but, uh, but it's really hard to work out what the role of a failed indie studio head is in the broader context of the industry. Um, 10 years running it successfully, one not so good. It, it's hard to work out where you fit. And to be fair, early in the piece, I had some very generous offers from people to come on board and do various roles for them, but I really wasn't ready. Um, you know, I talk here about the fun parts of a nervous breakdown, and um, I don't mean to use the language of mental health lightly because I was not uh, in a place where my mental health was light. Um, I was certainly depressed, I was certainly burned out, I was certainly in the midst of a nervous breakdown. Uh, I was certainly doing very, very badly. But pretty privately. It, it is interesting, the contrast between being a, a very, very public game developer, which I was, um, something like 50,000 Twitter followers. I turned my Twitter off because I was very keen not to be in public at this point in time. Um, that turned out to be a mistake. I probably should have paused it. 50,000 Twitter followers is useful when you're up to stuff. Um, but I, I definitely drew a line through that moment and said, oh, I am very much never going to make games again, both, both by choice and by circumstance. Uh, I could not see myself as a person ever doing that work again. Um, I was happy to help people who were doing stuff, but not, not for real. So, you know, I, uh, I took time to, uh, to work with my family. And as I said, my wife and I had been very busy. And I'll tell you that young children um, uh, really benefited from some full-on parenting, um, particularly as we went through COVID. Uh, I, I would not take those two years back under any circumstances. I would like to have been happier during them, um, but, uh, but the value of turning my focus, which had been on external matters to, to the internal you know, health of, and well-being of my family, helped a lot. And as I say, there's also you know, the fun parts of a nervous breakdown. You get to you know, tattoos and you know, focus on your hobbies, do a bunch of gardening. And at, at that point, I decided it was time to, you know, I'm going to get out of games. I'll, I'll go and become a therapist or something. I'll go and do some study, see how that goes. And there's a reasonably big gap here at the end to taking responsibility. And the thing about the way that I've always approached game development and the way that I've always approached the teams I work with and the studios I work with ever since, ever since I've been a junior is to be responsible. I do feel responsible for the team. I feel responsible for the game. I feel responsible for the people I work with. I, I carry an enormous amount of responsibility. But at this point, I also just couldn't help but think that there was a lot that was unfair. You know, it's possible to have a poker hand, play it perfectly, and lose the hand. I'm not saying we played it perfectly, but I didn't think, I mean, I think that game would have been great. I think the publishers were, were 
wrong and stupid not to sign it. <laughs> They're often wrong and stupid. Um, but, but there comes a point where you go, well, I, I did make all those decisions. Like, the road that led me here, I, I walked down on my own. And then, 10 years of being Morgan Jaffet of Defiant Development, um, and you know, I'm certainly not the biggest named indie dev, uh, but I was pretty well known, particularly in Australia. Um, I was very visible, I was very vocal. When you are a public person, you become one thing in public. It is hard to have a multi-dimensional and complex identity in the public sphere. And when you're an indie game developer, it's hard to keep your public personality out of your private personality because there is an enormous amount of bleed backwards and forwards. A lot of my friends are people in the games industry. A lot of my social environment is, is the games industry. A lot of the ways that I interact and share and I'm a member of a community is, is through the games industry. Being Morgan Jaffet of Defined Development was exhausting. And don't get me wrong either, like, I'm not a woman, I'm not a visible minority, but it was equally impossible not to worry that with 50,000 Twitter followers and a visible public presence, that one day that could just all turn into a rabid mob and it would all be over. Like, the, the, the ongoing pressure of the, the social media machine is, uh, is a tough thing. When you are just one thing, it's very hard to, uh, to live a complex and fulfilling life. There's a bunch of things that, uh, that play in to the way that you may uh, approach other people, the stories you tell, the, the ways you pull things together. Um, that, that being crushed down into that singular thing is also part of the kind of myth that keeps companies going, right? People think people in charge are in charge for some reason. They, they know more, they, they're wiser, they're cleverer. You know, we, 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 make, uh, we make sort of, you know, figureheads of people so that, you know, we can respect them. We assume that the person at the top of the pile has a good reason for being there. It's all just people. It's all just people. They're all strange and weird and, you know, have their own things going on. But a lot of those people have forced themselves into very boring shapes in order to do the job that they do. And, you know, it is important to have a public face that represents the company. It is important for a myriad of different reasons. It's important in business. It's important in hiring. It's important for, for the overall relationships, but it's all people in the end. And you have real limitations because, as I noted at the start, your public behavior has a really concrete impact on the people you work with and for. The things you say are going to be read, if by nobody else on the internet, they will be read by your team who will, um, it's, it's interesting, um, at one point I realized that whether or not I had a beard was one of the ways in which the team was trying to work out whether we were doing well or in trouble. <laughs> because when you lack the big picture information, when you don't, don't actually see the bank statement, you have to you know, cut open the animals and, and scry the augeries, right? You pick whatever the weather is and you go, gosh, is this, does this indicate a bigger picture? Is God angry? Is that why we're being punished? You have to be careful with your public persona. So this was two years of like, not a great phase for me, uh, where I was sad and people had gone on to do good things and I could be happy and proud of the, the work that had been done. But I was largely sad in private. And then, you know, we'd been working on capes in the meantime, and that had reached a place where it was 
in good shape. So we decided to, uh, to take it to Gamescom. And we were taking it to Gamescom to speak to publishers. That is the thing that I've done for Divine many, many times in my life previously. I was happy to do it for the, the new group. Uh, Spitfire Interactive is what that group of ex defined people were called. And you know they had Dan and I's support, and Dan was working very hard on it, and I was working gently on it. And we went to Gamescom, and in the lead up, I realized I was terrified, absolutely terrified to go and pitch this game, which is a thing I'd done many, many times before with, with complete confidence. And I, I was terrified of the question of like, well, what happened? Why didn't Defiant work out? Why is this a new studio? What's the relationship? How's that going on? And I did the thing that I hadn't done across the previous two years, which is I reached out to my friends in the industry and I said, I'm fucking terrified. <laughs> what am I going to do? And it was a great moment because they were able to talk me down off that ledge, which was not a very high ledge. So they said, nobody cares. Show the game. Is the game good? Nobody cares. You care. Nobody cares. Um, and I went to Gamescom and I pitched and we, we successfully signed a publisher for that title. And as I returned home and sat, for the first time, I had an idea for a game that I passionately wanted to make. And, and I realized I, I, something had changed. And I could see myself making games again, and I could see a way in which there could be a future for me in this industry. And th there were ways that I could represent things. It is, it is hard to say what burnout is and isn't and where it starts and ends. But for me, it ended when inspiration came back. And there was nothing I could do to force that to happen but to clear the space to allow it to happen. And God knows the first step on that road was being honest about the fact that I was in a terrible place. But while you're waiting for that kind of inspiration to, to come back and for new things to flow in, I do think there's a big question of like, what do you do? I mean, outside getting tattoos and gardening. And I think the answer that I found was to help other people. And there's a truism in my life uh, that is <laughs> universal, which is that uh, often I'm helping other people in the way that I'd like to be helped myself. And, and you hope that people will pick up on those cues. But I tell you what's even better than cues, which is just telling people that you'd like a hand. Um, this flies very much in the face of the things I was talking about in terms of public face for a company. And that is the challenge and the bind that I was stuck in. But there are big and wide mentor and peer groups to ask for, for help. So at this point, things started opening up again. Options and opportunities were suddenly in front of me that felt interesting and compelling. I had my own projects I was working on. I was able to help in a fundamental way on capes. I was able to work with, uh, with local developers on, uh, on a game that I'm not sure is announced yet, uh, but, uh, but doing some narrative support. Um, and, uh, and I've recently started working with a team in New Zealand, helping other people doing the thing that I'm good at has been very rewarding and fulfilling. It's, it's nice because the message that I'd taken away from, uh, from the closure of Defiant is that I was no longer good for anything. But the reason Defiant ran well for 10 years is because I'm actually quite good at a bunch of things. And it was nice to be able to start to apply them again. So at the same time, that was an opportunity for me to engage with those projects as a much more complex 
and three-dimensional human. I am no longer Morgan Jaffet to find development, which is good, which is good. I'm helped different projects in different ways. I helped a mobile project uh, that's based on narrative therapy and mobile health and rewrote all of their narratives so that it was a narrative therapy game with actual viable narrative design. Um, and that was good. The thing about all of this, fundamentally, this is a talk about how to mend a broken heart. And that's, that's really what it's about. Games, games will break your heart if you let it. But it'll heal it too if you let it. Companies, I think, are not the be all and end all. They tie up an enormous amount of energy. And often we have to build studios to make games, which is stupid, by the way. We need other models, and that's part of what I'm working on now. But what a company does is, is form human potential into a collective shape that it can achieve bigger things that we can do alone. And that is worth doing. It is work, worth working with other people to try and make bigger games and, and uh, achieve bigger things than we can do on our own. But if it's not gonna do that, let it go. Let people free. Let them go into the world and do other things. But before you do that, maybe make a better plan because that, that can really make a difference. You've got to have a plan that's worth your efforts, that's worth the people you bring together. Another thing that's really important to me, and this is something I did pretty well, um, but imperfectly, while the journey is good, tell your business partners, tell the people who work for you, tell them you love them and you're having a good time. Or at least tell them you love working with them if you don't want to be too confrontational. It's in, if you don't, life is, and this is the thing that I've realized in talking to so many studio heads, life is what you do every day. And if the things you're doing every day are, are exhausting you and draining you and running you down, use the power you have to change that, to build structures that renew you and invigorate you every day. And when it is good, tell people, share it. Let them know what that means to you. You know, Defiant Development was a commercial proposition that we built for a singular moment in time. And I'm really proud now. I find myself able to be proud of what we achieved over the nearly a decade that we ran that studio. But we did grow it out of a particular moment and a particular thing. And in the, that same process, we were able to be part of something bigger. There was an indie game. Uh, explosion happening around the world. There was an indie game explosion happening more specifically in Australia. We're able to be a part of that incredibly exciting moment in history. The studio closed and, you know, that left me with literally no idea what to do and no idea who I was. And if you find your public self becoming visible and one-dimensional, and creeping in at night and sliding in under the sheets, keeping your company, it might be time to think about how to, how to expand yourself, how to be three-dimensional, how to be vulnerable. I, it's, it's one thing to be popular, but it's another thing to be loved. You can be popular with a lot of people, but you can only be loved by a few. But relationships are everything. But if you're not vulnerable and honest, if you spend your entire time holding other people up, but not letting them hold you up, you're doing them a great disservice. And this applies not just in the broader scheme of things, but it applies in a studio fashion as well. If you're a studio founder and you're looking at yourself and you're going, but I'm indispensable. This company cannot run without me. You do that team a disservice. You're denying them the opportunity to grow into the roles that you occupy. You're denying them the opportunity 
to become the things that have led you along the path. Ultimately, when it comes to making indie games, running indie studios, uh, you can walk that road on your own and that's, that's a viable way to do it. But I will tell you it is better with company, it's better with peers and it's better with friends. And all I can tell you at the end of this is the answer I found, not easily. What heals a broken heart? Only, only people. People to love, dreams to chase, and doing it together. That's, that's my answer. Thank you so much. I appreciate you very much bearing with me for this story. This is a different talk to many of the talks I've given. Um, I'm delighted to answer questions if anybody has questions. Come on. And I wrote some things down because people like slides, but I'm really bad at slides. And, and it's hard because I'm asking you to ask me questions, but I've just given you a bunch of stuff to read, which is why I hate slides. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Morgan, for such an um, honest and vulnerable talk. Um, I'm sure everyone here uh, will agree with me that it was a, a beautiful, beautiful oh, moment you. that you've shared with us. <laughs> um, I'm curious now, like after the collapse of Defiant and yeah. working now with all these smaller studios, do you have a bit more hesitancy with studios to tell them to expand bigger oh, and man. getting to that same e size? Even when I was running Defiant, I told people, uh, m people would often come with questions about expansion. And expansion is a natural and easy thing to do when things are going well. I mean, uh, there's a problem when you are sitting on a great big pile of money and you're a company and effectively you should be putting that to some use, right? Because the game's been successful or a publisher deal signed. But... Even before this, I, I would always tell people that the fundamental is to know what your company is for, and growth can be a part of that or not a part of that. I think the thing that I spend more time than anything else talking to people about is people who have grown and are finding it uncomfortable. Um, and it's really hard to put the genie back in the bottle at that point in time. So yeah, I, 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 would, I would advise everybody, I mean, I know people in this room who have teams of three making games that are commercially successful that they can keep making forever. And look, don't get me wrong, there was a time when I said, if you've made a lot of money making a game, you probably should give some people some jobs because Australia was desperately in need of people to provide jobs. But yeah, I'm, I'm a long way from that now. I think that, I think thinking about a game and what it can sustain and how it can support people is, is the key step. And if, a, if people have companies they want to build, they, they should know what they're for and where they sit. And I think you should hire with great caution um, because, yeah, burn rates will kill you yeah. every, every single time. <laughs> every single time. So, yeah, I, I would... Uh, my short answer to that is yes, grow only with caution. Yeah, okay, thanks. Pleasure. Hello. Uh, one question I had was in regards to resisting the urge to grow. Yeah. One thing is that investors always want, you know, continual growth. Yeah. How do you push back against that without cutting off your source of funding? Yeah, I, th I mean, this is tricky. This is, this is definitely one of the places that we hit at the end, right? It's like we just didn't have a good story to tell investors because we weren't interested in doing the things that would tell a good story to investors. Um, I, I think... It's, it's really important to go into investment with eyes open as to what that means. Um, and I say eyes open to what that means in terms of what is the mechanism of control? How does, how does the board seat work in the example of an investor? Um, how does the decision making work? How can, how can leaders be replaced um, under certain circumstances? Who's actually in charge? And I think investment where you lose control 
for me, <laughs> defeats a lot of the purpose of being an indie developer. But it's certainly appropriate for people who really want to, who want to be on that exponential growth road for, for success or failure. I mean, the interesting thing is, I've spent a lot of time beating myself up about running a studio for 10 years and then not. And in the, in the investor tech startup space, that's the norm, right? Take the money, write it to the moon, or fall off. One's fine, and nobody, if you miss, you miss. You know, you, everybody took a good shot, and you try and fail fast and succeed fast. And, and if you want to be in that world, then absolutely be in that world, but go in with eyes open. Uh, I think we are more and more able to find investors who understand what games are. I don't know how this is going to shift. You know, when interest rates were zero, investment models changed a lot, and people were now suddenly just interested in getting a better than zero return on their money. So you could find investors for games who had a really different approach and mentality than the ones that had previously been around. But, uh, but yeah, I'm not 100% sure where we sit now that the interest rates are bouncing back up and people are starting to you know, want to bet on, tell me how this is going to explode and be worth 10 times as much. Um, yeah, I, as I say, know what you're for. Know if that's the ride you want to be on. If that's not the ride you want to be on, find compassionate investors who understand that they're investing in a long-term proposition that can be a really great revenue raiser for, for a long time. Thank you. Pleasure. Anybody else? Hey. Morgan, thank you for an amazing <laughs> heartfelt talk. That was actually just what I needed to hear right now in this moment. Um, my question for you is, was there a sweet spot size-wise where you're happiest with a smaller yeah. number of people? people in space. I mean, I can, I can tell you my personal sweet spot. And I think in a lot of ways, um, this is the story of why my personal sweet spot isn't necessarily the best way to run a business. Because my, my personal sweet spot is around that 30-person team. That's, that's where I can have the most impact and influence. That's where I can get the most done. Um, but it really pushes you into making a certain sort of game. And to find, you know, um, I spend a lot of time talking to very wise people who run very successful studios. And, uh, you know, Jamie Cheng at Clay always said to me, you are crazy putting all your eggs in one basket. If you have a 30-person studio, you need three games. You need to make much simpler games. You need to make more of them. You need to have the, the security and the backup of multiple partners. Um, I'm probably right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jamie's very smart. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's one of the takeaways for me is that the, the sweet spot and, and what I like to do and what I'm finding I'm most useful doing now with, with other studios is helping them around that, um, that transitional point as they go from like 15 up to that 30 point because that's the place I'm comfortable. But I, I worked at Ubisoft back in the day on you know, 300 person teams and got myself fired because uh, I'm really bad at you know, big company politics uh, in, that, in that context. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think it's important. Um, that is one thing I will say is through all of this, I've learned where I like to be making games. And it's not the same place that everybody I work with has, right? Like some people who worked for Defiant were on a journey where they really wanted to go work for a Blizzard, for example, and they really wanted to be a part of that big team doing big things that get plastered on the side of buses. And it's great because those people got to work with us, fabulous contributors, and then move on to do great things. Um, I think everybody has their, their comfort space and their comfort zone. So I know where mine is, and that's kind of where I try and lean in and be impactful now. Um, but I also, you know, I wouldn't... I wouldn't try and build a 30-person studio just because I like making games with 30 people at the moment. So. Oh, awesome. Sorry, just one No, more. excellent. Um, yeah, so you talked about uh, that transition from 15 to 30, um, which sounds, I mean, from, from my own experience, quite a, an interesting one. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I wondered if you had any kind of like... Um, specific bits of advice from your experiences about how to make that transition as smooth as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's probably another 
full talk. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's probably another full talk, and I will say, hit me up anytime. I'm, I'm very happy to talk. Um, but it's all about uh, structures and frameworks with individual leadership in there versus people who know everybody and can get things done. So when you're a 15-person studio, you know everybody in the room, you know everybody's speciality, you know who's working on, on what, and you don't need a lot of structure to, to get results. You just, somebody goes, oh, I'm gonna add this. You know, I know you're working on that, what, what's your take on that? And, and those things all happen very organically. As you get above that and hit the 30, 40 kind of person team, you actually need to make sure that you've put formal structures in place that work horizontally and vertically. So when I say horizontally and vertically, I mean you might have a department that works together. At, at Defiant, we used to have a writer's room of designers to, to break uh, new content, talk about what we were doing. We would, we would solve that problem collectively, but then one person would own it. And that meant that not only did one person own it, but like the whole design team could answer a question if somebody was like, hey, what, what the hell are you thinking with that one? And we were like, oh, that, that's important because it ties into this thing. So we had that kind of horizontal knowledge across the design team, but then you make sure you have vertical knowledge as well by putting you know, a designer, an artist, a programmer together on, on implementing this part, implementing this part. So by building that, that network, you build a really robust studio that can deal with the fact that no longer is it easy to just stand up and say, I know this bit is John's bit. John, what's the deal with that? Um, so yeah, that's 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 one of the one of the elements. More structure, more structure, and people whose job it is just to make sure that people have meaningful work to do. Like that's the other thing. Again, this is where that talk of hats comes in. Lots of people are really good individual contributors, and therefore they become leads. And then you have a lead who's like, oh yes, I'm also the best level designer, so I'm going to do this level because it's really important, so I'm going to get that done. That is a guaranteed way to make sure they do. Terrible job. <laughs> so um, Dan and I were always uh, famous for saying, you know, if you want something done badly and late, you can put it on our slate. <laughs> uh, otherwise, somebody who knows what they're doing should, like, we, we can do things. We used to be great individual contributors, but yeah, uh, bad and late is how we do it now. <laughs> so, Brilliant, thank you thanks. very much. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for your uh, talk, it was so great. Nice. Um, my question is, um, when the size of the studio grow, yeah. um, the overhead, uh, the administrative, uh, yeah. administrative, uh, overhead grows, yeah. um, and usually the founders are crea creative directors, they are yeah. game designers, and it's like you feel that you need to s stop doing what you like the most, that is yeah. do game design then stop doing creative direction, and then you run a business, and yeah. you don't develop games anymore. Yep. It's people under you that will, <laughs> will <Yep>. develop <laughs> video games, but not you. I, I think that is extremely true. And my answer to this now is different to my answer then. My answer to this now is that that is what you should do. You should stop being a creative director or a designer, and you should be a person who grows creative directors and designers. And that, that actually is a terribly rewarding thing to do. Um, to help other people become great, and, and trust me, a lot of them will become greater than you ever were. Um, but to do that, you need to let go. So it is so hard for us, particularly when we've built something from scratch, to let go, but I am freer now than I have ever been. And that freedom came at the cost of the studio, but it didn't need to. I could have just let go. And if I had just let go, I could have been free a lot earlier. Um, it's amazing when you stop viewing yourself as indispensable and, and start viewing yourself as responsible for, for helping everybody else become indispensable, it, it's, it's a really valuable shift. So, so that's the best I can offer from the experience I've had, but oh God, I know it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all I ever wanted to do was be creative director on games. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, yep, yeah. and, uh, 
And, you know, I've, I've had the chance to do it and I had a great time. But I actually have other things I want to do. That's, that's you know, when I talk about becoming one-dimensional, don't let yourself become one-dimensional. We're big, complex, strange things. You, you have other projects in you that you will be free to do when you empower people to do those roles and take those jobs. And then your company runs like a real one. Um, but, uh, but like I say, that was a hard pill for me to swallow. So. Thank you. I, I, I was thinking the same because um, in our case, we, we cannot afford not to grow yes. because it's the only way to survive yep. uh, because we had to offer work for her services, a lot of things just to keep the yep. company running and, and don't crash yes. down. Yep. And we went from three, three people to 62 people in two years. Yep. So it, it was very fast. Very fast. And w I felt that there, that there there were no people with the capabilities to take yes. responsibilities. Uh, but the, the answer I have to that is that they will only ever be able to when you let them. So you have to let go. And, and you have to let go, and they will drop some things. And they won't do them as well as you. And, and that's where you apply your creative direction skills to helping them and, and being a great mentor to them. Um, I, I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that tale of growth. We started as a work for hire studio, so I uh, understand where you're coming from. Um, and yeah, I, as I say, I think it is, uh, I think it is important. It's also important for um, corporate resilience, right? It's important to have multiple people who can sit in those roles and do those things in order to build a company that is strong and robust, as I didn't. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I definitely, as I say, a theme for the talk is advice, giving advice that I'm very poor at taking myself. But, uh, but there is a great road on the other side. Thank you. Pleasure. I think we are done. We have to end there. Thank you so much for coming along. I really appreciate it. <laughs>